3D printing has come a long way and a lot of that can be put down to firmware development. So today I want you to let me know if you agree with me when we look at the strengths of the four most popular firmwares and where they each need to improve. Before we start, my aim is to not criticize. I have nothing but love and respect for firmware devs of all kinds. We wouldn't be able to 3D print at home without them. With that in mind, some of the things that I'm gonna say are purely my opinion, but most of it comes from you, the viewers and the community. So consider me the messenger and let's jump in. We're gonna start with Bamboo Lab and I almost didn't include this, but then you have to consider that Bamboo Lab is probably the most popular printer available these days. It's hard to find an exact figure, but previously Bamboo Lab experienced a 3000% growth year on year. My understanding is that the Bamboo Lab printers in the wild now number in the millions. And while personally I think it's Bamboo Lab's hardware that is the main factor for their success, married to this hardware is very capable software and firmware. The firmware is capable in its general printing and offers things like its own version of input shaping and stepper motor noise cancellation but it's the integration within the whole ecosystem that makes it work so well, including seamless interaction with the slicer and app, and the HMS or health management system that offers information about errors when they occur and guides the owner through routine maintenance when required. Overall, it's pretty slick, but there's definitely areas where it can be improved. I think I speak for most people in saying they'd like Bamboo Lab firmware to be more open. And if we come to their GitHub, they have six repos, and the only one that's truly open source is Bamboo Studio, and that's because it was forked from open source Prusa Slicer. Most people use their Bamboo Lab printer as Bamboo Lab intended, only with first party software and slicers. But let's say there's an aspect that you're unsatisfied with, like the minimal interface on the P1 series. Well, previously you could get a third party add on, like the Big Tree Tech Panda Touch, which added a fully featured touchscreen interface in line with Bamboo Lab's other models. But with a controversial new firmware update, third party support is greatly diminished. And if you somehow haven't heard about this, I've linked my video on the topic below. For those with X1 series printers, there's still X1 Plus open source community firmware. This lets users take more control of the AP board, offering additional features, a lot more data, and more recently, even the option to expand the printer with custom hardware. This gives a glimpse of the improvements that could be made if the community had more access but even without that much control, the firmware would still benefit from being more open. Previously on my X1 Carbon, I installed an aftermarket hot end from E3D. And despite the fact this is an officially supported product, the firmware does not allow PID tuning for aftermarket hot ends. So on this printer, the hot end temperature is no longer as accurate. And you'll see once I reach the target of 250 degrees that the temperature blows by and takes about 30 seconds to stabilize and this will be trivial to fix with any other firmware. Now I just finished reviewing the Creality K2 Plus, a clone of the X1 Carbon, and that printer had some significant flaws, but it did include nozzle PID calibration from factory without needing to unlock anything. So in summary, the main thing Bamboo Lab firmware needs is to be more open and flexible for when users have a situation that falls outside what Bamboo Lab anticipates. And this includes having less reliance on the cloud, as currently you can't update the firmware from an SD card unless you have an X1 series printer. Next, we're going to look at Marlin firmware, which in my opinion can never get enough credit as it was the cornerstone as 3D printers exploded in popularity. Originally based on Sprinter and Goebel, Marlin was first launched in 2011 by its founder, Eric van der Zalm. Since then, it's been developed and grown by a dedicated team led by Scott Latine, also known as Thinky Head. If we rewind back seven years to the start of this channel, I had a Prusa Mark III. The firmware that it used was Marlin, and Prusa still use Marlin today, albeit with some heavy modifications. That was also the phase in which Creality exploded, with the CR10 followed by the Ender 3 and many other models. And Creality, with all of their printers for many years, also used Marlin firmware. It's not an exaggeration to say that for almost a decade, pretty much every 3D printer that came out was based on Marlin firmware. So the fact that Marlin was free and open source took away the requirement for 3D printer manufacturers to invest time and money into developing their own custom firmware. The other reason Marlin was so powerful is that it catered and still does for a very wide range of hardware without needing a single board computer like a Raspberry Pi. 
The entire Mylan firmware runs standalone on the mainboard, even if the processor of that mainboard is only as powerful as a potato. Previously, Mylan introduced the hardware abstraction layer, and this allows Mylan to be adapted from its original target, 8-bit Arduino boards, to pretty much everything, including Arduino clones and much more powerful 32-bit processors. And despite this handicap, Mylan's true miracle is that it's so feature-rich, leading the way with features like auto bed leveling, filament runout detection, but then adopting more modern features like input shaping. Whatever your hardware, there's a good chance that Mylan will support it. From tool changes, to IDEXs running in copy mode, and even dual extruder machines with custom switching hot ends. But these Mylan strengths also lead to its biggest weakness, firmware compilation. All of these various processors have different capabilities and, most importantly, capacities. So if Mylan is going to be run on a potato mainboard, you're going to have to leave some things out to get it to fit and run properly. Now I've made numerous videos over the years trying to explain step by step how to set up software for and then compile Marlin firmware. But I know a lot of people are too intimidated to try and that for those that do, they quite often run into errors that are hard to solve. On paper, it really doesn't sound that hard. We have two configuration files and we need to go through them in comment or uncomment sections, which will in turn enable or disable features so we can add what we want or cut out what we don't to save space. After that, we hit the compile button and hope for the best. And with any luck, we'll have a success message and a firmware file waiting for us to transfer to the mainboard SD card. But when things go wrong, they can go really wrong. And my word, can it be hard for anyone inexperienced to scroll back up through the errors and work out exactly what you've done wrong. A great solution for this was previously developed by the Marlin team in the form of the Auto Build Marlin plugin. Manual editing of the configuration files is still needed, but the compilation part is a little bit easier, with less variables and more information shown on a friendly screen. However, this is definitely still not foolproof, and if you're not paying attention to the dialogue down the bottom, you might get some strange errors. This one being because I started compilation during an update, and the last time I tried to compile using AutoBuild Marlin, it didn't work as intended. My printer had a 1.2 board, and when I looked through the source code, the option to select a 1.3 board was already disabled but AutoBuild was seemingly ignoring this. So instead, I had to ignore the AutoBuild plugin, instead working with platformio.ini, and that got me successfully over the line. But I think it's fair to say a beginner would have been completely lost in this scenario. As for an answer or suggestion, I'm afraid I don't really have one. Perhaps a better option is using pre-compiled firmware from the internet, or even some sort of web interface based firmware builder. There's so many different hardware combinations available, and the one you're seeing here is limited to Creality. But even with this limitation, there's no doubt the configuration process looks a lot more user-friendly. Having all of these drop-downs where you can simply enter values and select from popular modifications makes the job a lot easier. Please note that services like this take a lot of time and energy to set up, and then you gotta keep on updating them to suit the latest builds of the firmware. So this one requires a donation that's good for 12 months, and I think that's very reasonable. Next up, RepRap firmware. And I've only had around three or four printers running this, and that's way less than the others, so I'll keep this bit the shortest. RepRap firmware is also open source, hosted on GitHub. It has quite a few developers, but for some years now, the lead developer has been DC42. To some extent, the core firmware is pre-compiled, and this doesn't have to be done by the user. Each printer needs a specific configuration file, but typically this isn't an issue. Increasingly, we've seen online configurators that do a good job of guiding you through the initial configuration setup. And once you are set up, most of the printer's configuration ends up in a single file and making changes is as easy as editing, saving and rebooting. It's also worth mentioning that this configuration file and all of the other printer controls are accessed from a convenient web interface. This is available on desktop, but also from a mobile device. Where RepRap firmware really shines, but also where it can be intimidating, is that it's unmatched in giving you granular low-level control of how you want to run your printer. For instance, if you have specific hardware that requires one or more homing sequence to do specific things, you can just rewrite that using the G-code. The same goes for how the bed is probed and many other features. Because of this control, you can do some amazing things as demonstrated here in this video by my patron Dave Wood. This is his Sovol SV08, modified to be dual gantry, and later on, IDEX and tool changer as well. As you can see, both print heads can operate at once, and this is the result of custom work in the RepRap firmware configuration. But here lies the double-edged sword. 
The more advanced things you want to do, the steeper the learning curve and understanding required to do them. Let's look at a simple example, homing the printer, and it's still a G28G code. But the thing about G28 is it points to those specific homing configuration files we examined earlier. Let's have a closer look at this file. And if you're coming from a different firmware, there's some lines here that are going to be pretty confusing. So that means we need a good understanding of the G1 command. In other firmware, it's pretty simple, but in RepRep firmware, we have the usual parameters and then a bunch of extra ones. And to complicate things further, these are applied differently depending on which version of RepRap firmware you're running. So if we're setting up a custom homing file, we need to understand the H parameter, find the correct version of the firmware that we're using, and then get reading on the documentation provided. So tremendous control, but a large investment from the user required to utilize this. Especially since in our homing example, we're going to have at least four different files to edit and keep consistent. Another problem is that you need to memorize these single letter arguments, either that or you write really detailed comments that you keep up to date. By contrast, Clipper's printer config mainly uses plain English, so it's much easier to read without any reference. Last, but certainly not least, we have Clipper. I think most of my printers are running this now, and it's definitely become my favorite 3D printer firmware. Like Marlin and RepRap firmware, Clipper is completely open source and free to use. It has many contributors, including its founder, Kevin O'Connor. Clipper is quite different to firmwares like Marlin, where everything resides on the main board. A single board computer like a Raspberry Pi is introduced, but not like Octoprint, where it's simply sending commands to the standalone firmware. Clipper instead runs on both the Raspberry Pi and the original main board, with most of the heavy lifting done by the more powerful Raspberry Pi and the main board limited to just hardware control. This means you can get a lot more power out of a 3D printer without necessarily upgrading a poor main board. Many of Clipper's strongest features come from this approach. The more powerful Raspberry Pi allows very precise stepper movements, and even with an old 8-bit MCU, 175,000 steps per second. And because the Raspberry Pi is controlling everything else, we can actually have multiple main boards, each of them tasked to a different part of controlling the printer. We see an example of this in the SV08 tool changer build, where we have the equivalent to a Pi running the main firmware, with a main board to run the XYZ steppers and bed heater, and then each tool head has a dedicated MCU to run the heater, fans, and stepper motor. When it's done, there'll be seven different MCUs, all controlled by the single board computer. Clipper is also responsible for the marvel that is input shaping, and furthermore, easy tuning of that with a head-mounted accelerometer. Input shaping measures resonant frequencies and adjusts the stepper outputs to cancel them out. The result being that you can print at much higher speeds and accelerations without experiencing any ringing. It's no wonder that a version of input shaping is present in the other three firmwares that we've covered. Like RepRap firmware, Clipper is highly extensible, and its robust macro system mean that if you want, you can replace existing G-code commands. So for instance, if you need to rewrite the bed mesh calibrate sequence, you can do so, adding in conditional G-code to make sure that the bed has first been homed and has been heated up. You can customize any G-code command to be exactly how you need. I think for most people, what they really love about Clipper is that once set up, it's very easy to use. We have this great web interface, often enhanced by a simple USB webcam, and like RepRap firmware, our whole printer configuration is in one simple, easy to read file. And if we want to make a change, all we need to do is click save and restart, no firmware recompilation required. So many strengths, but let's talk about weaknesses, and I've already uttered the key phrase, once set up. I've often heard Clipper described as a firmware for programmers. And if you're dealing with Clipper, you better get used to working in the terminal over SSH, because even the easiest install methods will still require this. Just like compiling Marlin in VS Code, the thought of working like this is quite intimidating for many people and enough to put them off. I would argue in its defense that a lot of the time you can simply copy and paste commands from documentation, but regardless, the effect is still there. Especially when, if something goes wrong, for those people, they're going to feel particularly lost. I think the other main weakness is when it's time to update. And when you click the button in the web interface, you're given this scary message. You can click through and try and understand exactly what has changed, but the average user probably won't understand exactly what's being documented. So they'll tick the box, start the update, and hope for the best. In this instance, everything went well, but not that long ago, it was catastrophic for me. The first problem I had is a common one, where the versions mismatch, and you need to go through the process once more of recompiling and reflashing the MCU firmware. 
If you were the one who originally installed Clipper on the machine, this shouldn't be so bad, and it's simply a case of remembering the settings you need to select from the menu, but if you got the printer, with Clipper already installed by the manufacturer, you could really be in trouble here. Now what really went wrong for me, and I still have no idea why, that after updating everything I thought successfully, the printer decided it no longer had a network manager, it wouldn't connect to Wi-Fi, and therefore I couldn't use SSH to try and repair anything. I shifted all of the printers around on my back bench to make the one Ethernet port reach the printer, but that was also no good. To me, the installation was broken and I had to start again from the beginning. Now I was fortunate from prior planning that I had written a list of installation steps for this specific printer, and I had also published my printer configuration publicly on GitHub, but most people won't have that to fall back on. So it's important to have a backup, and fortunately Chris Riley just made a great video about this which I've linked below. Again, I think the solution to making Clipper more user-friendly is having more web tools. For instance, this tool that I found that offers a web interface version of what would normally be done over SSH. And a nice feature the Puyopoly Magneto X has is that from the regular web interface, if we add a port and command to the end, it will tell us a serial ID for our config without ever needing to go to the command line. I think Clipper would be a lot less daunting for the average person if these tools were evident in the pre-prepared SD card images so all the new user has to do is put in their Wi-Fi details and then we could have a specific setup tab where we could access our USB IDs, compile MCU firmware, and if needed, set up the printer configuration with dropdowns without ever needing to visit the command line. Two things struck me as I was editing this video. Firstly, three of these four firmwares are open source, but they also require a level of commitment and knowledge from the user if they want to customize and tweak. So I'm wondering, do people still want to tweak firmware and muck around or are they happy that a company is taking all of that out of their hands? Secondly, I see web interfaces with GUIs as a fantastic user-friendly default option, especially when power users can still access the traditional ways if that's what they prefer. But maybe I'm in the minority by thinking that way. Let me know in the comment section. Thank you to all the firmware developers for making all of this possible. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.